Chapter Eleven of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, Love bore such bitter and such deadly fruit. Leonard Tregonell went slowly up the steep, narrow lane with his dogs at his heels. It was a year since he had been this way. Good as the cover round about the waterfall was said to be for Woodcock he had carefully avoided the spot this season and his friends had been constrained to defer to his superior wisdom as a son of the soil he had gone farther afield for his sport and as there had been no lack of birds his guests had no reason for complaint yet jack vandeleur had said more than once i wonder you don't try the kiev we shot a lot of birds there last year now for the first time since that departed autumn he went up the hill to one of the happy hunting-grounds of his boyhood the place where he had fished and shot and trapped birds and hunted water-rats and climbed and torn his clothes in the careless schoolboy days when his conception of a perfectly blissful existence came as near as possible to the life of a north american indian he had always detested polite society and book-learning but he had been shrewd enough and quick enough at learning the arts he loved gunnery angling veterinary surgery he met a group of people near the top of the hill all the party except christabel and the baron one glance showed him that these two were missing from the cluster of men and women crowding through the gate that opened into the lane the waterfall is quite a shabby affair said miss st aubin there has been so little rain lately i felt ashamed to show mr faddie such a poor little dribble we are all going back to tea explained her mother i don't know what has become of mrs tregonell and the baron but i suppose they are loitering about somewhere perhaps you'll tell them we have all gone on to the farm yes i'll send them after you i told my wife i'd meet her at the kiev if i could he passed them and ran across the ploughed field while the others went down the hill talking and laughing he heard the sound of their voices and that light laughter dying away on the still air as the distance widened between him and them and he wondered if they were talking of his wife and of his seeming indifference to her folly the crisis had come he had watched her in blank amazement hardly able to believe his own senses to realize the possibility of guilt on the part of one whose very perfection had galled him and now he told himself there was no doubt of her folly no doubt that this tinselly pretender had fascinated her and that she was on the verge of destruction no woman could outrage propriety as she had been doing of late and yet escape danger the business must be stopped somehow even if he were forced to kick the baron out of doors in order to make an end of the entanglement and then what if she were to lift up her voice and accuse him if she were to turn that knowledge which he suspected her of possessing against him what then he must face the situation and pay the penalty of what he had done that was all it can't much matter what becomes of me he said to himself i have never had an hour's real happiness since i married her she warned me that it would be so warned me against my own jealous temper but i wouldn't listen to her i had my own way could she care for that man could she in spite of the coarseness of his own nature there was in leonard's mind a deep-rooted conviction of his wife's purity which was stronger even than the evidence of actual facts even now although the time had come when he must act he had a strange confused feeling like a man whose brain is under the influence of some narcotic which makes him see things that are not he felt as in some hideous dream long involved a maze of delusion and bedevilment from which there was no escape he went down into the hollow the high wooden gate stood wide open evidence that there was some one lingering below the leaves were still on the trees the broad feathery ferns were still green there was a low yellow light gleaming behind the ridge of rock and the steep earthly slope above the rush of the water sounded loud and clear in the silence leonard crept cautiously down the winding moss-grown track holding his dogs behind him in a leash and constraining those well-mannered brutes to perfect quiet he looked down into the deep hollow through which the water runs and over which there is that narrow footbridge whence the waterfall is seen in all its beauty an arc of silvery light cleaving the dark rock above and flashing down to the dark rock below christabel was standing on the bridge with de cazalet at her side they were not looking up at the waterfall their faces were turned the other way to the rocky river-bed fringed with fern and wild rank growth of briar and weed the baron was talking earnestly his head bent over christabel till it seemed to those furious eyes staring between the leafage as if his lips must be touching her face 
his hand clasped hers that was plain enough just then the spaniel stirred and rustled the dank dead leaves christabel started and looked up towards the trees that screened her husband's figure a guilty start a guilty look leonard thought but those eyes of hers could not pierce the leafy screen and they drooped again looking downward at the water beneath her feet she stood in a listening attitude as if her whole being hung upon de cazalet's words what was he pleading so intensely what was that honeyed speech to which the false wife listened unresistingly motionless as the bird spellbound by the snake so might eve have listened to the first tempter in just such an attitude with just such an expression every muscle relaxed the head gently drooping the eyelids lowered a tender smile curving the lips the first tempted wife might have hearkened to the silver-sweet tones of her seducer devil muttered leonard between his clenched teeth even in the agony of his rage rage at finding that this open folly which he had pretended not to see had been but the light and airy prelude to the dark theme of secret guilt that wrong which he felt most deeply was his wife's falsehood to herself her wilful debasement of her own noble character he had known her and believed in her as perfect and pure among women and now he saw her deliberately renouncing all claim to man's respect lowering herself to the level of the women who can be tempted he had believed her invulnerable it was as if diana herself had gone astray as if the very ideal and archetype of purity among women had become perverted he stood breathless almost holding back his dogs gazing listening with as much intensity as if only the senses of hearing and sight lived in him and all the rest were extinct he saw the baron draw nearer and nearer as he urged his prayer who could doubt the nature of that prayer until the two figures were posed in one perfect harmonious whole and then his arm stole gently round the slender waist christabel sprang away from him with a coy laugh not now she said in a clear voice so distinct as to reach that listener's ears i can answer nothing now to-morrow but my soul why delay to-morrow she repeated and then she cried suddenly hark there is someone close by did you not hear there had been no sound but the waterfall not even the faintest ruffle of a leaf the two dogs crouched submissively at their master's feet while that master himself stood motionless as a stone figure i must go cried christabel think how long we have stayed behind the others we shall set people wondering she sprang lightly from the bridge to the bank and came quickly up the rocky path a narrow winding track which closely skirted the spot where leonard stood concealed by the broad leaves of a chestnut she might almost have heard his hurried breathing she might almost have seen the lurid eyes of his dogs gleaming athwart the rank undergrowth but she stepped lightly past and vanished from the watcher's sight de cazalet followed christabel stop he exclaimed i must have your answer now my fate hangs upon your words you cannot mean to throw me over i have planned everything in three days we shall be at pes secure from all pursuit he was following in christabel's track but he was not swift enough to overtake her being at some disadvantage upon that slippery way where the moss-grown slabs of rock offered a very insecure footing as he spoke the last words christabel's figure disappeared among the trees upon the higher ground above him and a broad herculean hand shot out of the leafy background and pinioned him scoundrel profligate impostor hissed a voice in his ear and leonard tregonell stood before him white panting with flecks of foam upon his livid lips devil you have corrupted and seduced the purest woman that ever lived you shall answer to me her husband for your infamy oh is that your tune exclaimed the baron wrenching his arm from that iron grip they were both powerful men fairly matched in physical force cool hardened by rough living is that your game i thought you didn't mind you dastardly villain what did you take me for a common product of nineteenth-century civilization answered the other coolly one of those liberal-minded husbands who allow their wives as wide a license as they claim for themselves liar cried leonard rushing at him with his clenched fist raised to strike the baron caught him by the wrist held him with fingers of iron take care he said two can play at that game if it comes to knocking a man's front teeth down his throat i may as well tell you that i have given the frisco dentist a good bit of work in my time 
you forget that there's no experience of a rough and ready life that you have had which i have not gone through twice over if i had you in colorado we'd soon wipe off this little score with a brace of revolvers let cornwall be colorado for the nonce we could meet here as easily as we could meet in any quiet nook across the channel or in the wilds of america no time like the present no spot better than this if we had only the barkers said the cazalet but unluckily we haven't i'll meet you here to-morrow at daybreak say sharp seven we can arrange about the pistols to-night vandeleur will come with me he'd run any risk to serve me and i dare say you could get little monty to do as much for you he's a good plucked one do you mean it unquestionably very well tell vandeleur what you mean and let him settle the details in the meantime we can take things quietly before the ladies there is no need to scare any of them i am not going to scare them down termagant said leonard to the irish setter as the low light branches of a neighbouring tree were suddenly stirred and a few withered leaves drifted down from the rugged bank above the spot where the two men were standing well i suppose you're a pretty good shot said the baron coolly taking out his cigar-case so there'll be no disparity by the by there was a man killed here last year i heard a former rival of yours yes there was a man killed here answered leonard walking slowly on perhaps you killed him i did answered leonard turning upon him suddenly i killed him as i hoped to kill you as i would kill any man who tried to come between me and the woman i loved he was a gentleman and i am sorry for him he fired in the air and made me feel like a murderer he knew how to make that last score i have never had a peaceful moment since i saw him fall face downward on that broad slab of rock on the other side of the bridge you see i am not afraid of you or i shouldn't tell you this i suspected as much from the time i heard the story said de cazalet i rarely believe in those convenient accidents which so often dispose of inconvenient people but don't you think it might be better for you if you were to choose a different spot for to-morrow's meeting two of your rivals settled in the same gully might look suspicious for i dare say you intend to kill me i shall try answered leonard then suppose we were to meet on those sands turbar with sands i think you call the place not much fear of interruption there i should think at seven o'clock in the morning you can settle that and everything else with vandeleur said leonard striding off with his dogs and leaving the baron to follow at his leisure de cazalet walked slowly back to the farm meditating deeply it's devilish unlucky that this should have happened he said to himself an hour ago everything was going on velvet we might have got quietly away to-morrow for i know she meant to go cleverly as she fenced with me just now and left my gentleman to his legal remedy which would have secured the lady and her fortune to me as soon as the divorce court business was over he would have followed us with the idea of fighting no doubt but i should have known how to give him the slip and then we should have started in life with a clean slate now there must be no end of a row if i kill him it will be difficult to get away and if i bolt how am i to be sure of the lady will she come to my lure when i call her will she go away with me to-morrow yes that will be my only chance i must get her to promise to meet me at bodmin road station in time for the plymouth train there's one starts at eleven i can drive from trebarworth to bodmin with a good horse take her straight through to london and from london by the first available express to edinburgh she shall know nothing of what has happened till we are in scotland and then i can tell her that she is a free woman and my wife by the scottish law a bond which she can make as secure as she likes by legal and religious ceremonies the baron had enough insight into the feminine character to know that a woman who has leisure for deliberation upon the verge of ruin is not very likely to make the fatal plunge the boldly deliberately bad are the rare exceptions among womankind the women who err are for the most part hustled and hurried into wrong-doing hemmed round and beset by conflicting interests bewildered and confused by false reasoning whirled into the maelstrom of fashion helpless as the hunted hare the baron had pleaded his cause eloquently as he thought had won christabel almost to consent to elope with him but not quite she had seemed so near yielding yet had not yielded she had asked for time time to reflect upon the fatal step and reflection was just that one privilege which must not be allowed to her strange he thought that not once had she spoken of her son the wrong she must inflict upon him her agony at having to part with him 
beautiful fascinating although he deemed her proud as he felt at having subjugated so lovely a victim it seemed to de cazalet that there was something hard and desperate about her as of a woman who went wrong deliberately and of set purpose yet on the brink of ruin she drew back and was not to be moved by any special pleading of his to consent to an immediate elopement vainly he had argued that the time had come that people were beginning to look askance that her husband's suspicions might be aroused at any moment she had been rock in her resistance of these arguments but her consent to an early flight must now be extorted from her delay or hesitation now might be fatal if he killed his man and he had little doubt in his own mind that he should kill him it was essential that his flight should be instant the days were past when juries were disposed to look leniently upon gentlemanly homicide if he were caught red-handed the penalty of his crime would be no light one i was a fool to consent to such a wild plan he told himself i ought to have insisted upon meeting him on the other side of the channel but to draw back now might look bad and would lessen my chance with her no there is no alternative course i must dispose of him and get her away without the loss of an hour the whole business had to be thought out carefully his intent was deadly and he planned this duel with as much wicked deliberation as if he had been planning a murder he had lived among men who held all human life except their own lightly and to whom duelling and assassination were among the possibilities of everyday existence he thought how if he and the three other men could reach that lonely bend of the coast unobserved they might leave the man who should fall lying on the sand with never an indication to point how he fell de cazalet felt that in vandeleur there was a man to be trusted he would not betray even though his friend were left there dead upon the low level sand waste for the tide to roll over him and hide him and wrap the secret of his doom in eternal silence there was something of the freebooter in jack vandeleur an honour among thieves kind of spirit which the soul of that other freebooter recognised and understood we don't want little montague thought de cazalet one man will be second enough to see fair play the fuss and formality of the thing can be dispensed with that little beggar's ideas are too insular he might round upon me so meditating upon the details of to-morrow the baron went down the hill to the farm where he found the mount royal party just setting out on their homeward journey under the shades of evening stars shining faintly in the blue infinite above them leonard was not among his wife's guests nor had he been seen by any of them since they met him at the field gate an hour ago he has made tracks for home no doubt said jack vandeleur they went across the fields and by the common beyond trevalga walking briskly talking merrily in the cool evening air all except mopsy from whose high-heeled boots there was no surcease of pain alas those wurtemberg heels and the boots just half a size too small for the wearer for how many a bitter hour of woman's life have they to answer de cazalet tried in vain during that homeward walk to get confidential speech with christabel he was eager to urge his new plan the departure from bodmin road station which she was always surrounded he fancied even that she made it her business to avoid him coquette he muttered to himself savagely they are all alike i thought she was a little better than the rest but they are all ground in the same mill he could scarcely get a glimpse of her face in the twilight she was always a little way ahead or a little way behind him now with jessie bridgman now with emily st aubyn skimming over the rough heathy ground flitting from group to group when they entered the house she disappeared almost instantly leaving her guests lingering in the hall too tired to repair at once to their own rooms content to loiter in the glow and warmth of the wood fires it was seven o'clock they had been out nearly nine hours what a dreadfully long day it has been exclaimed emily st aubyn with a stifled yawn isn't that the usual remark after a pleasure party demanded mr fitzjesse i have found the unfailing result of any elaborate arrangement for human felicity to be an abnormal lengthening of the hours just as every strenuous endeavour to accomplish some good work for one's fellow-men infallibly provokes the enmity of the class to be benefited oh it has all been awfully enjoyable don't you know said miss st aubyn and it was very sweet of mrs tregonell to give us such a delightful day but i can't help feeling as if we had been out a week and now we have to dress for dinner which is rather a trial why not sit down as you are let us have a tailor gown and shooting jacket dinner as a variety upon a calico ball suggested little monty impossible we should feel dirty and horrid said miss st aubyn 
the freshness and purity of the dinner-table would make us ashamed of our grubbiness besides however could we face the servants no the effort must be made come mother you really look as if you wanted to be carried upstairs by voluntary contributions murmured fitz jesse aside to miss bridgman briarus himself could not do it single-handed as one of our vivacious home rulers might say the baron de cazalet did not appear in the drawing-room an hour later when the house-party assembled for dinner he sent his hostess a little note apologizing for his absence on the ground of important business letters which must be answered that night though why a man should sit down at eight o'clock in the evening to write letters for a post which would not leave beaucastle till the following afternoon was rather difficult for any one to understand all humbug about those letters you may depend said little monty who looked as fresh as a daisy in his smooth expanse of shirt-front with a single diamond stud in the middle of it like a lighthouse in a calm sea the baron was fairly done athlete as he pretends to be hadn't a leg to stand upon came in limping i wouldn't mind giving long odds that he won't show till to-morrow afternoon it's a case of gruel and bandages for the next twenty-four hours leonard came into the drawing-room just in time to give his arm to mrs st aubyn he made himself more agreeable than usual at dinner as it seemed to that worthy matron talked more laughed louder and certainly drank more than his wont the dinner was remarkably lively in spite of the baron's absence indeed the conversation took a new and livelier turn upon that account for everybody had something more or less amusing to say about the absent one stimulated and egged on with quiet malice by mr fitz jesse anecdotes were told of his self-assurance his vanity his pretentiousness his pedigree was discussed and settled for his antecedents his married life were all submitted to the process of conversational vivisection rather rough on mrs tregonell isn't it murmured little monty to the fair dopsy do you think she really cares dopsy asked incredulously don't you not a straw she could not care for such a man as that after being engaged to mr hamley hamley was better form i admit and i used to think mrs t as straight as an arrow but i confess i've been staggered lately did you see what a calm queenly look she had all the time people were laughing at the cazalet asked dopsy a woman who cared one little bit for a man could not have taken it so quietly you think she must have flamed out said something in defence of her admirer you forget your tennyson and how guinevere marred her friend's point with pale tranquillity women are so deuced deep dear tennyson murmured dopsy whose knowledge of the laureate's works had not gone very far beyond the may queen and the charge of the six hundred it was growing late in the evening when de cazalet showed himself the drawing-room party had been in very fair spirits without him but it was a smaller and quieter party than usual for leonard had taken captain vandeleur off to his own den after dinner and mr montagu had offered to play a fifty game left-handed against the combined strength of dopsy and mopsy christabel had been at the piano almost all the evening playing with a breadth and grandeur which seemed to rise above her usual style the ladies made a circle in front of the fire with mr faddy and mr fitz jesse talking and laughing in a subdued tone while those grand harmonies of beethoven's rose and fell upon their half indifferent half admiring ears christabel played the closing chords of the funeral march of a hero as de cazalet entered the room he went straight to the piano and seated himself in the empty chair by her side she glided into the melancholy arpeggios of the moonlight sonata without looking up from the keys they were a long way from the group at the fire all the length of the room lay in deep shadow between the lamps on the mantelpiece and neighbouring tables and the candles upon the piano pianissimo music seemed to invite conversation you have written your letters she asked lightly my letters were a fiction i did not want to sit face to face with your husband at dinner after our conversation this afternoon at the waterfall you can understand that can't you christabel don't don't do that what she asked still looking down at the keys don't shudder when i call you by your christian name as you did just now christabel i want your answer to my question of to-day i told you then that the crisis of our fate had come i tell you so again to-night more earnestly if it is possible to be more in earnest than i was to-day i am obliged to speak to you here almost with the near shot of those people because time is short and i must take the first chance that offers it has been my accursed luck never to be with you alone i think this afternoon was the first time that you and i have been together alone since i came here 
you don't know how hard it has been for me to keep every word and look within check always to remember that we were before an audience yes there has been a good deal of acting she answered quietly but there must be no more acting no more falsehood we have both made up our minds have we not my beloved i think you love me yes christabel i feel secure of your love you did not deny it to-day when i asked that thrilling question those hidden eyes the conscious droop of that proud head were more eloquent than words and for my love christabel no words can speak that it shall be told by and by in language that all the world can understand told by my deeds the time has come for decision i have had news to-day that renders instant action necessary if you and i do not leave cornwall together to-morrow we may be parted for ever have you made up your mind hardly she answered her fingers still slowly moving over the keys in those plaintive arpeggios what is your difficulty dearest do you fear to face the future with me i have not thought of the future is it the idea of leaving your child that distresses you i have not thought of him then it is my truth my devotion which you doubt give me a little more time for thought she said still playing the same sotto voce accompaniment to their speech i dare not everything must be planned to-night i must leave this house early to-morrow morning there are imperative reasons which oblige me to do so you must meet me at bodmin road station at eleven you must christabel if our lives are to be free and happy and spent together vacillation on your part will ruin all my plans trust yourself to me dearest trust my power to secure a bright and happy future if you do not want to be parted from your boy take him with you he shall be my son i will hold him for you against all the world you must leave this house early to-morrow morning she said looking up at him for the first time why for a reason which i cannot tell you it is a business in which someone else is involved and i am not free to disclose it yet you shall know all later you will tell me when we meet at bodmin road yes ah then you have made up your mind you will be there my best and dearest heaven bless you for that sweet consent had we not better leave heaven out of the question she said with a mocking smile and then slowly gravely deliberately she said yes i will meet you at eleven o'clock to-morrow at bodmin road station and you will tell me all that has happened what secret can i withhold from you love my second self the fair half of my soul urgently as he pleaded his cause certain as he had been of ultimate success he was almost overcome by her yielding it seemed as if a fortress which a moment before had stood up between him and the sky massive invincible the very type of the impregnable and everlasting had suddenly crumbled into ruin at his feet his belief in woman's pride and purity had never been very strong yet he had believed that here and there in this sinful world invincible purity was to be found but now he could never believe in any woman again he had believed in this one to the last although he had set himself to win her even when he had been breathing the poison of his florid eloquence into her ear even when she had smiled at him a willing listener there had been something in her look some sublime inexpressible air of stainless womanhood which had made an impassable distance between them and now she had consented to run away with him she had sunk in one moment to the level of all disloyal wives his breast thrilled with pride and triumph at the thought of his conquest and yet there was a touch of shame shame that she could so fall emily st aubin came over to the piano and made an end of all confidential talk now you are both here do give us that delicious little duet of lecoq's she said we want something cheerful before we disperse good gracious mrs tregonell how bad you look cried the young lady suddenly as white as a ghost i am tired to death answered christabel i could not sing a note for the world really then we mustn't worry you thanks so much for that lovely beethoven music the andante or the pastoral or the pathetique was it not so sweet good night said christabel you won't think me rude if i am the first to go not at all we are all going pack up your wools mother i know you have only been pretending to knit 
we are all half asleep i believe we have hardly strength to crawl upstairs candles were lighted and mrs tregonell and her guests dispersed the party from the billiard-room meeting them in the hall these lighter-minded people the drama of whose existence was just now in the comedy stage went noisily up to their rooms but the baron who was usually among the most loquacious retired almost in silence nor did christabel do more than bid her guests a brief good-night neither leonard nor his friend jack vandeleur had shown themselves since dinner whether they were still in the squire's den or whether they had retired to their own rooms no one knew the baron's servant was waiting to attend his master he was a man who had been with de cazalet in california mexico and south america who had lived with him in his bachelorhood and in his married life knew all the details of his domestic career had been faithful to him in wealth and in poverty knew all that there was to be known about him the best and the worst and had made up his mind to hold by an employment which had been adventurous profitable and tolerably easy not entirely free from danger or from the prospect of adversity yet always hopeful so thorough a scamp as the baron must always find some chance open to him thus at least argued henri de mescam his unscrupulous ally the man was quick clever able to turn his hand to anything valet groom cook courier as necessity demanded is salathiel pretty fresh asked the baron fit as a fiddle he hasn't been out since you hunted him four days ago that's lucky he will be able to go to the pace to-morrow morning have him harnessed to that american buggy of mr tregonell's at six o'clock i suppose you know that it's hardly light at six there will be quite enough light for me pack my smallest portmanteau with linen for a week and a second suit no dress clothes and have the trap ready in the stable yard when the clock strikes six i have to catch a train at launceston at seven forty five you will follow in the afternoon with the luggage to your london room sir yes if you don't find me there you will wait for further instructions you may have to join me on the other side of the channel i hope so sir sick of england already never cared much for it sir i began to think i should die of the dullness of this place rather more luxurious than our old quarters at st heliers ten years ago when you were marker at jewson's while i was teaching drawing in french at the fashionable academies of the island that was bad sir but luxury isn't everything in life a man's mind goes to rest in a place of this kind well there will not be much rest for you in future i believe how would you like it if i were to take you back to the shores of the pacific that's just what i should like sir you were a king there and i was your prime minister and i may be king again perhaps this time with a queen a proud and beautiful queen lamescam smiled and shrugged his shoulders the queenly element was not quite wanting in the past sir he said Psha, henri the ephemeral fancy of the hour such chance entanglements as those do not rule a man's life perhaps not sir but i know one of those chance entanglements made lima unpleasantly warm for us and if after you winged don silvio there hadn't been a pair of good horses waiting for us you might never have seen the outside of peru and if a duel was dangerous in lima it would be ten times more dangerous in cornwall would it not henri of course it would sir but you are not thinking of anything like a duel here you can't be so mad as to think of it certainly not and now you can pack that small portmanteau while i take a stretch i shan't take off my clothes a man who has to be up before six should never trifle with his feelings by making believe to go to bed End of chapter 11chapter twelve of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve she stood up in bitter case with a pale yet steady face part one the silence of night and slumber came down upon the world shadow and darkness were folded round and about it the ticking of the old eight-day clock in the hall of the bracket clock in the corridor and of half a dozen other timepieces conscientiously performing in empty rooms took that solemn and sepulchral sound which all clocks down to the humblest dutchman assume after midnight sleep peace and silence seemed to brood over all human and brute life at mount royal yet there were some who had no thought of sleep that night in mr tregonell's dressing-room there was the light of lamp and fire deep into the small hours 
the master of the house lolled half-dressed in an armchair by the hearth while his friend captain vandeleur in smoking jacket and slippers lounged with his back to the chimney-piece and a cigarette between his lips a whisky bottle and a couple of siphons stood on a tray on the squire's writing-table an open pistol-case near at hand you'd better lie down for a few hours said captain vandeleur i'll call you at half-past five i'd rather sit here i may get a nap by and by perhaps you can go to bed if you are tired i shan't oversleep myself i wish you'd give up this business tregonell said his friend with unaccustomed seriousness this man is a dead shot we heard of him in bolivia don't you remember a man who has spent half his life in shooting galleries and who has lived where life counts for very little why should you stake your life against his it isn't even betting you're good enough at big game but you've had very little pistol practice even if you were to kill him which isn't on the cards you'd be tried for murder and where's the advantage of that i'll risk it answered leonard doggedly i saw him with my wife's hand clasped in his saw him with his lips close to her face close enough for kisses heard her promise him an answer to-morrow by heaven there shall be no such to-morrow for him and for me for one of us there shall be an end of all things i don't believe mrs tregonell is capable began jack thoughtfully mumbling his cigarette you've said that once before and you needn't say it again capable why man alive i saw them together nothing less than the evidence of my own eyes would have convinced me i have been slow enough to believe there is not a man or woman in this house yourself included who has not in his secret soul despised me for my slowness and yet now because there is a question of a pistol shot or two you fence round and try to persuade me that my wife's good name is immaculate that all of which you have seen and wondered at for the last three weeks means nothing those open flirtations seldom do mean anything said jack persuasively a man may belong to the hawk tribe and yet not be without certain latent instincts of compassion and good feeling perhaps not but secret meetings do what i saw at the kiev to-day was conclusive besides the affair is all settled you and de cazalet have arranged it between you he is willing that there should be no witness but you the whole business will rest a secret between us three and if we get quietly down to the sands before any one is astir to see us no one else need ever know what happened there if there is bloodshed the thing must be known it will seem like an accident true answered vandeleur looking at him searchingly like that accident last year at the kiev poor hamley's death isn't to-morrow the anniversary by the by yes the date has come round again dates have an awkward knack of doing that there is a cursed mechanical regularity in life which makes a man wish himself in some savage island where there is no such thing as an almanac said vandeleur taking out another cigarette if i had been crusoe i should never have stuck up that post i should have been glad to get rid of quarter day in christabel's room at the other end of the long corridor there was only the dim light of the night lamp nor was there any sound save the ticking of the clock and the crackling of the cinders in the dying fire yet here there was no more sleep nor peace than in the chamber of the man who was to wager his life against the life of his fellow-man in the pure light of the dawning day christabel stood at her window dressed just as she had left the drawing-room looking out at the sky and the sea and thinking of him who at this hour last year was still a part of her life perchance a watcher then as she was watching now gazing with vaguely questioning eyes into the illimitable panorama of the heavens worlds beyond worlds suns and planetary systems scattered like grains of sand over the awful desert of infinite space innumerable immeasurable the infinitesimals of the astronomer the despair of faith yes a year ago and he was beneath that roof her friend her counsellor if need were for she had never trusted him so completely never so understood and realized all the nobler qualities of his nature as in those last days after she had set an eternal barrier between herself and him she stood at the open lattice the cold night air blowing upon her fever-heated face her whole being absorbed not in deliberate thought but in a kind of waking trance strange pictures came out of the darkness and spread themselves before her eyes she saw her first lover lying on the broad flat rock at st necton's kiev face downward shot through the heart the water stained with the life-blood slowly oozing from his breast 
and then when that picture faded into the blackness of night she saw her husband and oliver de cazalet standing opposite to each other on the broad level sands at trebarwith the long waves rising up behind them like a low wall of translucent green crested with silvery whiteness so they would stand face to face a few hours hence from her lurking-place behind the trees and brushwood at the entrance of the kiev she had heard the appointment made and she knew that at seven o'clock those two were to meet with deadliest intent she had so planned it a life for a life she had no shadow of a doubt as to which of those two would fall three months ago on the riffle she had seen the bear in skill as a marksman tested she had seen him the wonder of a crowd of those rustic sports seen him perform feats which only a man who has reduced pistol shooting to a science would attempt against this man leonard tregonell good all-round sportsman as he was could have very little chance leonard had always been satisfied with that moderate skilfulness which comes easily and unconsciously he had never given time and labour to any of the arts he pursued content to be able to hold his own among parasites and flatterers a life for a life repeated christabel her lips moving dumbly her heart throbbing heavily as if it were beating out those awful words a life for a life the old law the law of justice god's own sentence against murder the law could not touch this murderer but there was one way by which that cruel deed might be punished and i found it the slow silent hours wore on christabel left the window shivering with cold though cheeks brow and lips were burning she walked up and down the room for a long while till the very atmosphere of the room nay of the house itself seemed unendurable she felt as if she were being suffocated and this sense of oppression became so strong that she was sorely tempted to shriek aloud to call upon some one for rescue from that stifling vault the feeling grew to such intensity that she flung on her hat and coat and went quickly downstairs to a lobby door that opened into the garden a little door which she had unbolted many a night after the servants had locked up the house in order to steal out in the moonlight and among the dewy flowers and across the dewy turf to those shrubbery walks which had such a mysterious look half in light and half in shadow she closed the door behind her and stood with the night wind blowing round her looking up at the sky clouds were drifting across the starry dome and the moon like a storm-beaten boat seemed to be hurrying through them the cold wind revived her and she began to breathe more freely i think i was going mad just now she said to herself and then she thought she would go out upon the hills and down to the churchyard in the valley on this night of all nights she would visit angus hamley's grave it was long since she had seen the spot where he lay since her return from switzerland she had not once entered a church jessie had remonstrated with her gravely and urgently but without eliciting any explanation of this falling off in one who had been hitherto so steadfastly devout i don't feel inclined to go to church jessie she said coolly there is no use in discussing my feelings i don't feel fit for church and i am not going in order to gratify your idea of what is conventional and correct i am not thinking of this and its conventional aspect i have always made light of conventionalities but things must be in a bad way with you christabel when you do not feel fit for church things are in a bad way with me answered christabel with a dogged moodiness which was insurmountable i never said they were good this surrender of old pious habits had given jessie more uneasiness than any other fact in christabel's life her flirtation with the baron must needs be meaningless frivolity jessie had thought since it seemed hardly within the limits of possibility that a refined and pure-minded woman could have any real penchant for that showy adventurer but this persistent avoidance of church meant mischief and now in the deep dead of night silence christabel went on her lonely pilgrimage to her first lover's grave oh happy summer day when sitting by her side outside the maidenhead coach all her own through life as it seemed he told her how if she had the ordering of his grave she was to bury him in that romantic churchyard hidden in a cleft of the hill she had not forgotten this even amidst the horror of his fate and had told the vicar that mr hamley's grave must be at minster and no otherwhere then had come his relations suggesting burial places with family associations vaults mausoleums the pomp and circumstance of sepulture but christabel had been firm and while the others hesitated a paper was found in the dead man's desk requesting that he might be buried at minster how lonely the world seemed in this solemn pause between night and morning 
never before had christabel been out alone at such an hour she had travelled in the dead of night and had seen the vague dim night world from the window of a railway carriage but never until now had she walked across these solitary hills after midnight it seemed as if for the first time in her life she were alone with the stars how difficult it was in her present state of mind to realize that those lights tremulous in the deep blue vault were worlds and combinations of worlds almost all of them immeasurably greater than this earth on which she trod to her they seemed living watchers of the night solemn mysterious beings looking down at her with all understanding eyes she had an awful feeling of their companionship as she looked up at them a mystic sense that all her thoughts the worst and best of them were being read by that galaxy of eyes strangely beautiful did the hills and the sky the indefinite shapes of the trees against the edge of the horizon the mysterious expanse of the dark sea seemed to her in the night silence she had no fear of any human presence but there was an awful feeling in being as it were for the first time in her life alone with the immensities those hills and gorges so familiar in all phases of daylight from sunrise to after set of sun assumed titanic proportions in this depth of night and were as strange to her as if she had never trodden this path before what was the wind saying as it came moaning and sobbing along the deep gorge through which the river ran what did the wind say as she crossed the narrow bridge which trembled under her light footfall surely there was some human meaning in that long minor wail which burst suddenly into a wild unearthly shriek and then died away in a low sobbing tone as of sorrow and pain that grew dumb from sheer exhaustion and not because there was any remission of pain or sorrow with that unearthly sound still following her she went up the winding hillside path and then slowly descended to the darkness of the churchyard so sunk and sheltered that it seemed like going down into a vault just then the moon leapt from behind an inky cloud and in that ghostly light christabel saw the pale grey granite cross which had been erected in memory of angus hamley it stood up in the midst of nameless mounds and humble slate tablets pale and glittering an unmistakable sign of the spot where her first lover lay once only before to-night had she seen that monument absorbed in the pursuit of a pagan scheme of vengeance she had not dared to come within the precincts of the church where she had knelt and prayed through all the sinless years of her girlhood to-night some wild impulse had brought her here to-night when that crime which she called retribution was on the point of achievement she went with stumbling footsteps through the long grass across the low mounds till she came to that beneath which angus hamley lay she fell like a lifeless thing at the foot of the cross some loving hand had covered the mound of earth with primroses and violets and there were low clamouring roses all around the grave the scent of sweet briar was mixed with the smell of earth and grass some one had cared for that grave although she who so loved the dead had never tended it oh my love my love she sobbed with her face upon the grass and the primrose leaves and her arms clasping the granite my murdered love my first last only lover before to-morrow's sun is down your death will be revenged and my life will be over i have lived only for that only for that angus my love my love she kissed the cold wet grass more passionately than she had ever kissed the dead face mouldering underneath it only to the dead to the utterly lost and gone is given this supreme passion love sublimated to despair from the living there is always something kept back something saved and garnered for an after-gift some reserve in the mind or the heart of the giver but to the dead love gives all with a wild self-abandonment which knows not restraint nor measure the wife who while this man yet lived had been so rigorously true to honour and duty now poured into the deaf dead ears a reckless avowal of love love that had never faltered never changed love that had renounced the lover and had yet gone on loving to the end the wind came moaning out of the valley again with that sharp human cry as of lamentation for the dead angus murmured christabel piteously angus can you hear me do you know oh my god is there memory or understanding in the world where he has gone or is it all a dead blank help me my god i have lost all the old sweet illusions of faith i have left off praying hoping believing 
i have only thought of my dead thought of death and of him till all the living world grew unreal to me and god and heaven were only like old half-forgotten dreams angus for a long time she lay motionless her cold hands clasping the cold stone her lips pressed upon the soft dewy turf her face buried in primrose leaves then slowly and with an effort she raised herself upon her knees and knelt with her arms encircling the cross that sacred emblem which had once meant so much for her but which since that long blank interval last winter seemed to have lost all meaning one great overwhelming grief had made her a pagan thirsting for revenge vindictive crafty stealthy as an american indian on the trail of his deadly foe subtle as greek or oriental to plan and to achieve a horrible retribution she looked at the inscription on the cross legible in the moonlight deeply cut in large gothic letters upon the grey stone filled in with dark crimson vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord who had put that inscription upon the cross it was not there when the monument was first put up christabel remembered going with jessie to see the grave in that dim half-blank time before she went to switzerland then there was nothing but a name and a date and now in awful distinctness there appeared those terrible words god's own promise of retribution the claim of the almighty to be the sole avenger of human wrongs and she reared by a religious woman brought up in the love and fear of god had ignored that sublime and awful attribute of the supreme she had not been content to leave her lover's death to the great avenger she had brooded on his dark fate until out of the gloom of despair there had arisen the image of a crafty and bloody retribution whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed so runs the dreadful sentence of an older law the newer lovelier law which began in the afterglow of philosophy the dawn of christianity bids man leave revenge to god and she who had once called herself a christian had planned and plotted making herself the secret avenger of a criminal who had escaped the grip of the law must he lie in his grave unavenged until the day of judgment she asked herself god's vengeance is slow an hour later aunt christabel pale and exhausted her garments heavy with dew was kneeling by her boy's bed in the faint light of the night lamp kneeling by him as she had knelt a year ago but never since her return from switzerland praying as she had not prayed since angus hamley's death after those long passionate prayers she rose and looked at the slumberer's face her husband's face in little but oh how pure and fresh and radiant god keep him from boyhood's sins of self-love and self-indulgence from manhood's evil passions hatred and jealousy all her life to come seemed too little to be devoted to watching and guarding this beloved from the encircling snares and dangers of life pure and innocent now in this fair dawn of infancy he nestled in her arms he clung to her and believed in her what business had she with any other fears desires or hopes god having given her the sacred duties of maternity the master passion of motherly love i have been mad she said to herself i have been living in a ghastly dream but god has awakened me god's word has cured me god's word had come to her at the crisis of her life a month ago while her scheme of vengeance seemed still far from fulfilment that awful sentence would hardly have struck so deeply it was on the very verge of the abyss that those familiar words caught her just when the natural faltering of her womanhood upon the eve of a terrible crime made her most sensitive to a sublime impression the first faint streak of day glimmered in the east a pale cold light livid and ghostly upon the edge of the sea yonder white and wan upon the eastward points of rock and headland when jessie bridgman was startled from her light slumbers by a voice at her bedside she was always an early riser and it cost her no effect to sit up in bed with her eyes wide open and all her senses on the alert christabel what is the matter is leo ill no leo is well enough get up and dress yourself quickly jessie i want you to come with me on a strange errand but it is something that must be done and at once christabel you are mad no i have been mad i think you must know it this is the awakening come jessie jessie had sprung out of bed and put on slippers and dressing-gown without taking her eyes off christabel presently she felt her cloak and gown 
why you are wet through where have you been to angus hamley's grave who put that inscription on the cross i did nobody seemed to care about his grave no one attended to it i got to think the grave my own property and that i might do as i liked with it but those awful words what made you put them there i wanted the man who killed him to be reminded that there is an avenger wash your face and put on your clothes as fast as you can every moment is of consequence said christabel she would explain nothing jessie urged her to take off her wet cloak to go and change her gown and shoes but she refused with angry impatience there will be time enough for that afterwards she said what i have to do will not take long but it must be done at once pray be quick jessie struggled through her hurried toilette and followed christabel along the corridor without question or exclamation they went to the door of the baron de cazalet's room a light shone under the bottom of the door and there was the sound of someone stirring within christabel knocked and the door was opened almost instantly by the baron himself is it the trap he asked it's an hour too soon no it is i monsieur de cazalet may i come in for a few minutes i have something to tell you christabel my he stopped in the midst of that eager exclamation at sight of the other figure in the background End of chapter twelve part one chapter twelve part two of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve part two he was dressed for the day carefully dressed like a man who in a crisis of his life wishes to appear at no disadvantage his pistol-case stood ready on the table a pair of candles burnt low in the sockets of the old silver candlesticks and a heap of charred and torn paper in the fender showed that the baron had been getting rid of superfluous documents christabel went into the room followed by jessie the baron staring at them both in blank amazement he drew an armchair near the expiring fire and christabel sank into it exhausted and half fainting what does it all mean asked de cazalet looking at jessie and why are you here with her why is she here asked jessie there can be no reason except she touched her forehead lightly with the tips of her fingers christabel saw the action no i am not mad now she said i believe i have been mad but that is all over monsieur de cazalet you and my husband are to fight a duel this morning on her bar with sands my dear mrs tregonell what a strange notion don't take the trouble to deny anything i overheard your conversation yesterday afternoon i know everything would it not have been better to keep the knowledge to yourself and to remember your promise to me last night yes i remember that promise i said i would meet you at bodmin road after you had shot my husband there was not a word about shooting your husband no but the fact was in our minds all the same in yours as well as in mine only there was one difference between us you thought that when you had killed leonard i would run away with you that was to be your recompense for murder i meant that you should kill him but that you should never see my face again you would have served my purpose you would have been the instrument of my revenge christabel do not call me by that name i am nothing to you i never could under any possible phase of circumstances be any nearer to you than i am at this moment from first to last i have been acting a part when i saw you at that shooting match on the riffle i said to myself here is a man who in any encounter with my husband must be fatal my husband killed the only man i ever loved in a duel without witnesses a duel forced upon him by insane and causeless jealousy whether that meeting was fair or unfair in its actual details i cannot tell but at the best it was more like a murder than a duel when through miss bridgman's acuteness i came to understand what that meeting had been i made up my mind to avenge mr hamley's death for a long time my brain was under a cloud i could think of nothing plan nothing then came clearer thoughts and then i met you and the scheme of my revenge flashed upon me like a suggestion direct from satan i knew my husband's jealous temper and how easy it would be to fire a train there and i made my plans with that view you lent yourself very easily to my scheme lent myself cried the baron indignantly and then with a savage oath he said 
i loved you mrs tregonell and you made me believe that you loved me i let you make fine speeches and i pretended to be pleased at them answered christabel with supreme scorn i think that was all no madam it was not all you fooled me to the top of my bent what those lovely looks those lowered accents all meant nothing it was all a delusion an acted lie you never cared for me no answered christabel my heart was buried with the dead i never loved but one man and he was murdered as i believed and i made up my mind to avenge his murder whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed that sentence was in my mind always when i thought of leonard tregonell i meant you to be the executioner and now now god knows how the light has come but the god i worshipped when i was a happy sinless girl has called me out of the deep pit of sin called me to remorse and atonement you must not fight this duel you must save me from this horrible crime that i planned save me and yourself from blood guiltiness you must not meet leonard at trebarwith and stamp myself as a cur to oblige you after having lent myself so simply to your scheme of vengeance lend myself as complacently to your repentance no mrs tregonell that is too much to ask i will be your bravo if you like since i took the part unconsciously but i will not brand myself with the charge of cowardice even for you you fought a duel in south america and killed your adversary mr fitzjesse told me so everybody knows that you are a dead shot who can call you a coward for refusing to shoot the man whose roof has sheltered you who never injured you against whom you can have no ill will don't be too sure of that he is your husband when i came to mount royal i came resolved to win you only because i had deceived you the woman you admired was a living lie oh if you could have looked into my heart only yesterday you must have shrunk from me with loathing when i led you on to play the seducer's part i was plotting murder murder which i called justice i knew that leonard was listening i had so planned that he should follow us to the kiev i heard his stealthy footsteps and the rustle of the boughs you were too much engrossed to listen but all my senses were strained and i knew the very moment of his coming it is a pity you did not let your drama come to its natural denouement sneered de cazalet furious with the first woman who had ever completely fooled him when your husband was dead for there is not much doubt as to my killing him you and i could have come to an understanding you must have had some gratitude however i am not bloodthirsty and since mrs tregonell has cheated me out of my devotion fooled me with daydreams of an impossible future i don't see that i should gain much by shooting mr tregonell no there would be no good to you in that profitless bloodshed it is i who have wronged you i who wilfully deceived you degrading myself in order to lure my husband into a fatal quarrel tempting you to kill him forgive me if you can and forget this wild wicked dream conscience and reason came back to me beside that quiet grave to-night what good could it do him who lies there that blood should be spilt for his sake monsieur de cazalet if you will give up all idea of this duel i will be grateful to you for the rest of my life you have treated me very cruelly said the baron taking both her hands and looking into her eyes half in despairing love half in bitterest anger you have fooled me as never man was fooled before i think tricked me and trifled with me and i owe you very little allegiance if you and i were in south america i would show you very little mercy no my sweet one i would make you play out the game you should finish the drama you began finish it in my fashion but in this world of yours hemmed round with conventionalities i am obliged to let you off easily as for your husband well i have exposed my life too often to the aim of a six-shooter to be called coward if i let this one opportunity slip he is nothing to me or i to him since you are nothing to me he may go and i may go i will leave a line to tell him that we have both been the dupes of a pretty little acted charade devised by his wife and her friends and instead of going to meet him at trebarwith i'll drive straight to launceston and catch the early train will that satisfy you mrs tregonell i thank you with all my heart and soul you have saved me from myself you are a much better man than i thought you baron said jessie speaking for the first time 
she had stood by a quiet spectator of the scene listening intently ready at any moment to come to christabel's rescue if need were understanding for the first time the moving springs of conduct which had been so long a mystery to her thank you miss bridgman i suppose you were in the plot looked on and laughed in your sleeve as you saw how a man of the world may be fooled by sweet words and lovely looks i knew nothing i thought mrs tregonell possessed by the devil if she had let you go on if you had shot her husband i should not have been sorry for him for i know he killed a much better man than himself and i am hard enough to hug the stern old law a life for a life but i should have been sorry for her she is not made for such revenges and now you will be reconciled with your husband i suppose mrs tregonell you too will agree to forget the past and to live happily ever afterwards sneered the cazalet looking up from the letter which he was writing no there can be no forgetfulness for either of us i have to do my duty to my son i have to win god's pardon for the guilty thoughts and plans which have filled my mind so long but i owe no duty to mr tregonell he has forfeited every claim may i see your letter when it is finished de cazalet handed it to her without a word a brief epistle written in the airiest tone ascribing all that had happened at the kiev to a sportive plot of mrs tregonell's and taking a polite leave of the master of the house when he reads that i shall be half way to launceston he said as christabel gave him back the letter i am deeply grateful to you and now good-bye she said gravely offering him her hand he pressed the cold slim hand in his and gently raised it to his lips you have used me very badly but i shall love and honour you to the end of my days he said as christabel left him jessie was following but de cazalet stopped her on the threshold come he said you must give me the clue to this mystery surely you were in it you who know her so well must have known something of this i knew nothing i watched her with fear and wonder after after mr hamley's death she was very ill mentally ill she sank into a kind of apathy not madness but terribly near the confines of madness then suddenly her spirits seemed to revive she became eager for movement amusement an utterly different creature from her former self she and i who had been like sisters seemed ever so far apart i could not understand this new phase of her character for a whole year she had been unlike herself a terrible year thank god this morning i have seen the old christabel again half an hour afterwards the baron's dog-cart drove out of the yard and half an hour after his departure the baron's letter was delivered to leonard tregonell who muttered an oath as he finished reading it and then handed it to his faithful jack what do you say to that he asked by jove i knew mrs t was straight answered the captain in his unsophisticated phraseology but it was a shabby trick to play you all the same i dare say mop and dop were in it those girls are always ready for larks leonard muttered something the reverse of polite about dop and mop and went straight to the stable-yard where he cancelled his order for the trap which was to have conveyed him to trevor with sands and where he heard of the baron's departure for launceston mystified and angry he went straight upstairs to his wife's room all barriers were broken down now all reticence was at an end plainest words straightest measures befitted the present state of things christabel was on her knees in a recess near her bed a recess which held a little table with her devotional books and a prie dieu chair a beautiful head of the salvator mundi painted on china at munich gave beauty and sanctity to this little oratory she was kneeling on the prie dieu her arms folded on the purple velvet cushion her head leaning forward on the folded arms in an attitude of prostration and self-abandonment her hair falling loosely over her white dressing-gown she rose at leonard's entrance and confronted him a ghost-like figure deadly pale your lover has given me the slip he said roughly why didn't you go with him you mean to go i have no doubt you have both made your plans to that end but you want to sneak away to get clear of this country perhaps before people have found out what you are women of your stamp don't mind what scandal they create but they like to be out of the row you are mistaken his wife answered coldly unmoved by his anger as she had ever been untouched by his love the man who left here this morning was never my lover never could have been had he and i lived under the same roof for years but i intended him for the avenger of the one man whom i did love with all my heart and soul 
the man you killed what do you mean faltered leonard with a dull grey shade creeping over his face it had been in his mind for a long time that his secret was suspected by his wife but this straight sudden avowal of the fact was not the less a shock to him you know what i mean did you not know when you came back to this house that i had fathomed your mystery that i knew whose hand killed angus hamley you did know it leonard you must have known for you knew that i was not a woman to fling a wife's duty to the winds without some all-sufficient reason you knew what kind of wife i had been for four dull peaceful years how honestly i had endeavoured to perform the duty which i took upon myself in loving gratitude to your dear mother did you believe that i could change all at once become a heartless empty-headed lover of pleasure hold you my husband at arm's length outrage propriety defy opinion without a motive so powerful a purpose so deadly and so dear that self-abasement loss of good name counted for nothing with me you are a fool said leonard doggedly no one at the inquest so much as hinted at foul play why should you suspect any one for more than one good reason first your manner on the night before angus hamley's death the words you and he spoke to each other at the door of his room i asked you then if there were any quarrel between you and you said no but even then i did not believe you there was not much love between us you did not expect that did you asked her husband savagely you invited him to your house you treated him as your friend you had no cause to distrust him or me you must have known that i knew that you loved him i had been your faithful and obedient wife faithful and obedient yes a man might buy faith and obedience in any market i knew that other man was master of your heart great heaven can i forget how i saw you that night hanging upon his words all your soul in your eyes we were talking of life and death it was not his words that thrilled me but the deep thoughts they stirred within me thoughts of the great mystery the life beyond the veil do you know what it is to speculate upon the life beyond this life when you are talking to a man who bears the stamp of death upon his brow who is as surely devoted to the grave as socrates was when he talked to his friends in the prison but why do i talk to you of these things you cannot understand no i am outside the pale am i not sneered leonard made of a different clay from that sickly sentimental worshipper of yours who turned to you when he had worn himself out in the worship of ballet girls i was not half fine enough for you could not talk of shakespeare and the musical glasses was it a pleasant sensation for me do you think to see you two sentimentalizing and poetizing day after day beethoven here and byron there and all the train of maudlin modern versifiers who have made it their chief business to sap the foundations of domestic life why did you bring him into your house why can't you guess because i wanted to know the utmost and the worst to watch you two together to see what venom was left in the old poison to make sure if i could that you were staunch to put you to the test god knows i never faltered throughout that ordeal said christabel solemnly and yet you murdered him you asked me how i know of that murder shall i tell you you were at the kiev that day you did not go by the beaten track where the ploughman must have seen you no you crept in by stealth the other way clambered over the rocks ah you start you wonder how i know that you tore your coat in the scramble across the arch and a fragment of the cloth was caught upon a bramble i have that scrap of cloth and i have the shooting jacket from which it was torn under lock and key in yonder wardrobe now will you deny that you were at the kiev that day no i was there hamley met me there by appointment you were right in your suspicion that night we did quarrel not about you but about his treatment of that vandeleur girl i thought he had led her on flirted with her fooled her you thought ejaculated christabel with ineffable scorn well i told him so at any rate told him that he would not have dared to treat any woman so scurvily with her brother and her brother's friend standing by if the good old wholesome code of honour had not gone out of fashion i told him that forty years ago in the duelling age men had been shot for a smaller offence against good feeling and then he rounded on me and asked me if i wanted to shoot him if i was trying to provoke a quarrel and then i hardly know how the thing came about it was agreed that we should meet at the kiev at nine o'clock next morning both equipped as if for woodcock shooting 
game bag dogs and all our guns loaded with swan shot and that we should settle our differences face to face in that quiet hollow without witnesses if either of us dropped the thing would seem an accident and would entail no evil consequences upon the survivor if one of us were only wounded why but you did not mean that interrupted christabel with flashing eyes you meant your shot to be fatal it was fatal muttered leonard never mind what i meant god knows how i felt when it was over and that man was lying dead on the other side of the bridge i had seen many a noble beast with something almost human in the look of him go down before my gun but i had never shot a man before who could have thought there would have been so much difference christabel clasped her hands over her face and drew back with an involuntary recoil as if all the horror of that dreadful scene were being at this moment enacted before her eyes never had the thought of angus hamley's fate been out of her mind in all the year that was ended to-day this day the anniversary of his death the image of that deed had been ever before her mental vision beckoning her and guiding her along the pathway of revenge a lurid light you murdered him she said in low steadfast tones you brought him to this house with evil intent yes with your mind full of hatred and malice towards him you acted the traitor's base hypocritical part smiling at him and pretending friendship while in your soul you meant murder and then under this pitiful mockery of a duel a duel with a man who had never injured you who had no resentment against you a duel upon the shallowest most preposterous pretense you kill your friend and your guest you kill him in a lonely place with none of the safeguards of ordinary duelling and you have not the manhood to stand up before your fellow men and say i did it shall i go and tell them now asked leonard his white lips tremulous with impotent rage they would hang me most likely perhaps that is what you want no i never wanted that answered christabel for our boy's sake for the honour of your dead mother's name i would have saved you from a shameful death but i wanted your life a life for a life that is why i tried to provoke your jealousy why i planned that scene with the baron yesterday i knew that in a duel between you and him the chances were all in his favour i had seen and heard of his skill you fell easily into the trap i laid for you i was behind the bushes when you challenged de Cazalet. it was a plot then you had been plotting my death all that time your songs and dances and games and folly all meant the same thing yes i plotted your death as you did angus hamley's answered christabel slowly deliberately with steady eyes fixed on her husband's face only i relented at the eleventh hour you did not leonard stared at her in dumb amazement this new aspect of his wife's character paralyzed his thinking powers which had never been vigorous he felt as if in the midst of a smooth summer sea he had found himself suddenly face to face with that huge wave known on this wild northern coast which generated by some mysterious power in the wide atlantic rolls on its deadly course in overwhelming might engulfing many a craft which but a minute before was riding gaily on a summer sea yes you have cause to look at me with horror in your eyes said christabel i have steeped my soul in sin i have plotted your death in the purpose and pursuit of my life i have been a murderer it is god's mercy that held me back from that black gulf what gain would your death have been to your victim would he have slept more peacefully in his grave or have awakened happier on the judgment day if he had consciousness and knowledge in that dim mysterious world he would have been sorry for the ruin of my soul sorry for satan's power over the woman he once loved last night kneeling on his grave these thoughts came into my mind for the first time i think it was the fact of being near him almost as if there was some sympathy between the living and the dead leonard i know how wicked i have been god pity and pardon me and make me a worthy mother for my boy for you and me there can be nothing but lifelong parting well yes i suppose there would not be much chance of comfort or union for us after what has happened said leonard moodily ours is hardly a case in which to kiss again with tears as your song says i must be content to go my way and let you go yours it is a pity we ever married but that was my fault i suppose have you any particular views as to your future 
I shall not molest you, but I should be glad to know that the lady who bears my name is leading a reputable life. I shall live with my son, for my son. You need have no fear that I shall make myself a conspicuous person in the world. I have done with life, except for him. I care very little where I live. If you want Mount Royal for yourself, I can have the old house at Penley made comfortable for Jessie Bridgman and me. I dare say I can be as happy at Penley as here. I don't want this house. I detest it. Do you suppose I am going to waste my life in England or in Europe? Jack and I can start on our travels again. The world is wide enough. There are two continents on which I have never set foot. I shall start for Calcutta tomorrow, if I can, and explore the whole of India before I turn my face westwards again. I think we understand each other fully now. Stay, there is one thing. I am to see my son when, and as often as I please, I suppose. I will not interfere with your rights as a father. I am glad of that. And now I suppose there is no more to be said. I leave your life, my honour, in your own keeping. Good-bye. God be with you she answered solemnly, giving that parting salutation its fullest meaning. And so, without touch of lip or hand, they parted for a lifetime. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Mount Royal, Volume 3 by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 we have done with tears and treasons i wonder if there's any ancient crime in the tregonell family that makes the twenty-fifth of october a fatal date mopsy speculated with a lachrymose air on the afternoon which followed the baron's hasty departure this very day last year mr hamley shot himself and spoiled all our pleasure and to-day the baron de cazalet rushes away as if the house was infected mrs tregonell keeps her own room with a nervous headache and mr tregonell is going to carry off jack to be broiled alive in some sandy waste among prowling tigers or to catch his death of cold upon more of those horrid mountains one might just as well have no brother if he ever sent us anything from abroad we shouldn't feel his loss so keenly said dopsy in a plaintive voice but he doesn't if he were to traverse the whole of africa we shouldn't be the richer by a single ostrich feather and those undyed natural ostriches are such good style south america teems with golden jewels peru is a proverb but what are we the better off it is rather bad form for the master of a house to start on his travels before his guests have cleared out remarked mopsy and an uncommonly broad hint for the guests to hasten the clearing out process retorted dopsy i thought we were good here for another month till christmas perhaps christmas at an old cornish manor house would have been too lovely like one of the shilling annuals a great deal nicer said mopsy for you never met with a country house in a christmas book that was not peopled with ghosts and all kind of ghastliness luncheon was lively enough albeit de cazalet was gone and mrs tregonell was absent and mr tregonell painfully silent the chorus of the passionless the people for whom life means only dressing and sleeping and four meals a day found plenty to talk about jack vandeleur was in high spirits he rejoiced heartily at the turn which affairs had taken that morning having from the first moment looked upon the projected meeting on trebar with sands as likely to be fatal to his friend and full of peril for all concerned in the business he was too thorough a freelance prided himself too much on his personal courage and his recklessness of consequences to offer strenuous opposition to any scheme of the kind but he had not faced the situation without being fully aware of its danger and he was very glad the thing had blown over without bloodshed or law-breaking he was also glad on mrs tregonell's account very glad to know that this one woman in whose purity and honesty of purpose he had believed had not proved herself a simulacrum a mere phantasmagoric image of goodness and virtue still more did he exult at the idea of revisiting the happy hunting-grounds of his youth that ancient romantic world in which the youngest and most blameless years of his life had been spent pleasant to go back under such easy circumstances with leonard's purse to draw upon to be the rich man's guide philosopher and friend in a country which he knew thoroughly pray what is the cause of this abrupt departure of de cazalet and this sudden freak of our hosts inquired mrs torrington of her next neighbour mr fitzjesse who was calmly discussing a cutlet a la maintenon unmoved by the shrill chatter of the adjacent dopsy i hope it is nothing wrong with the drains 
no i am told the drainage is simply perfect people always declare as much till typhoid fever breaks out and then it is discovered that there is an abandoned cesspool in direct communication with one of the spare bedrooms or a forgotten drain-pipe under the drawing-room floor i never believe people when they tell me their houses are wholesome if i smell an unpleasant smell i go said mrs torrington there is often wisdom in flight replied the journalist but i do not think this is a case of bad drainage no more do i returned mrs torrington dropping her voice and becoming confidential of course we both perfectly understand what it all means there has been a row between mr and mrs tregonell and de cazalet has got his conge from the husband i should have introduced him to the outside of my house three weeks ago had i been the squire said fitzjesse but i believe the flirtation was harmless enough and i have a shrewd idea it was what the thieves call a put-up thing done on purpose to provoke the husband why should she want to provoke him ah why that is the mystery you know her better than i do and must be better able to understand her motives but i don't understand her in the least protested mrs torrington she is quite a different person this year from the woman i knew last year i thought her the most devoted wife and mother the house was not half so nice to stay at but it was ever so much more respectable i had arranged with my next people lodway court near bristol to be with them at the end of the week but i suppose the best thing we can all do is to go at once there is an air of general break-up in mr tregonell's hasty arrangements for an indian tour rather like the supper-party in macbeth is it not said fitzjesse except that her ladyship is not to the fore i call it altogether uncomfortable exclaimed mrs torrington pettishly how do i know that the lodway court people will be able to receive me i may be obliged to go to an hotel heaven avert such a catastrophe it would be very inconvenient with a maid and no end of luggage one is not prepared for that kind of thing when one starts on a round of visits for dopsy and mopsy there was no such agreeable prospect as a change of scene from one well-found country house to another to be tumbled out of this lap of luxury meant a fall into the dreariness of south Belgravia and the king's road long monotonous arid streets with all the dust that had been ground under the feet of happy people in the london season blown about in dense clouds for the discomfiture of the outcast who must stay in town when the season is over sparse dinners coals measured by the scuttle smoky fires worn carpets flat beer and the whole gamut of existence equally flat stale and unprofitable dopsy and mopsy listened with doleful countenances to jack's talk about the big things he and his friend were going to do in bengal the tigers the wild pigs and wild peacocks they were going to slay why had not destiny made them young men that they too might prey upon their species and enjoy life at somebody else's expense i'll tell you what said their brother in the most cheerful manner of course you won't be staying here after i leave mrs tregonell will want to be alone when her husband goes you had better go with the squire and me as far as southampton he'll frank you we can all stop at the duke of cornwall to-morrow night and start for southampton by an early train next morning you can lunch with us at the dolphin see us off by steamer and go on to london afterwards that will be a ray of jollity to gild our last hour of happiness said mopsy oh how i loathe the idea of going back to those lodgings and pa the governor is a trial i must admit said jack but you see the european idea is that an ancient parent can't hang on hand too long there's no wheeling him down to the ganges and leaving him to settle his account with the birds and the fishes and even in india that kind of thing is getting out of date i wouldn't so much mind him said dopsy plaintively if his habits were more human but there are so many traits in his character especially his winter cough which remind one of the lower animals poor old patter sighed jack with a touch of feeling he was not often at home would you believe it that he was once almost a gentleman yes i remember an early period in my life when i was not ashamed to own him but when a fellow has been travelling steadily downhill for fifteen years his ultimate level must be uncommonly low true sighed mopsy we have always tried to rise superior to our surroundings but it has been a terrible struggle there have been summer evenings when that wretched slavey has been out with her young man that i have been sorely tempted to fetch the beer with my own hands there is a jug and bottle entrance at the place where we deal 
but i have suffered agonies of thirst rather than to so lower myself said dopsy with the complacence of conscious heroism right you are said jack who would sooner have fetched beer in the very eye of society than gone without it one must draw the line somewhere and to go from a paradise like this to such a den as that exclaimed dopsy still harping on the unloveliness of the pimlico lodging cheer up old girl i dare say mrs t will ask you again she's very good-natured she has behaved like an angel to us answered dopsy but i can't make her out there's a mystery somewhere there's always a skeleton in the cupboard don't you try to haul old bony out said the philosophical captain this was after luncheon when jack and his sisters had the billiard-room to themselves mr tregonell was in his study making things straight with his bailiff coachman butler in his usual business-like and decisive manner mr fitzjesse was packing his portmanteau meaning to sleep that night at penzance he was quite shrewd enough to be conscious of the tempest in the air and was not disposed to inflict himself upon his friends in the hour of trouble or to be bored by having to sympathize with them in their affliction he had studied mrs tregonell closely and he had made up his mind that conduct which was out of harmony with her character must needs be inspired by some powerful motive he had heard the account of her first engagement knew all about little fishkey and he had been told the particulars of her first lover's death it was not difficult for so astute an observer of human nature to make out the rest of the story little monty had been invited to go as far as southampton with the travellers the st aubins declared that home duties had long been demanding their attention and that they must positively leave next day mr faddie accepted an invitation to accompany them and spend a week at their fine old place on the other side of the county thus without any trouble on christabel's part her house was cleared for her when she came down to luncheon next day two or three hours after the departure of leonard and his party who were to spend that night at plymouth with some idea of an evening at the theatre on the part of mop and dop she had only the st aubyns and mr faddie to entertain even they were on the wing as the carriage which was to convey them to bodmin road station was ordered for three o'clock in the afternoon christabel's pale calm face showed no sign of the mental strain of the last twenty-four hours there was such a relief in having done with the false life which she had been dealing in the past month such an infinite comfort in being able to fall back into her old self such an unspeakable relief too in the sense of having saved herself on the very brink of the black gulf of sin that it was almost as if peace and gladness had returned to her soul once again she had sought for comfort at the one divine source of consolation once more she had dared to pray and this tardy resumption of the old sweet habit of girlhood seemed like a return to some dear home from which she had been long banished even those who knew so little of her real character were able to see the change in her countenance what a lovely expression mrs tregonell has to-day murmured mr faddy to his neighbour mrs st aubyn tenderly replenishing her hawk glass as a polite preliminary to filling his own so soft so madonna-like i suppose she is rather sorry for having driven away her husband said mrs st aubyn severely that has sobered her there are depths in the human soul which only the confessor can sound answered mr faddy who would not be betrayed into saying anything uncivil about his hostess would that she might be led to pour her griefs into an ear attuned to every note in the diapason of sorrow i don't approve of confession and i never shall bring myself to like it said mrs st aubyn sturdily it is un-english but your rubric dear lady surely you stand by your rubric if you mean the small print paragraphs in my prayer-book i never read em answered the squire's wife bluntly i hope i know my way through the church service without any help of that kind mr faddie sighed at this boeotian ignorance and went on with his luncheon it might be long before he partook of so gracious a meal a woman whose church views were so barbarous as those of mrs st aubyn might keep a table of primitive coarseness a squire westernish kind of fare might await him in the st aubyn mansion an hour later he pressed christabel's hand tenderly as he bade her good-bye a thousand thanks for your sweet hospitality he murmured gently this visit has been most precious to me it has been a privilege to be brought near the lives of those blessed martyrs st sergius and st bacchus to renew my acquaintance with dear st mertheriana whose life i only dimly remembered to kneel at the rustic shrines of st hulette and st piran it has been a period of mental growth the memory of which i shall ever value 
and then with a grave uplifting of two fingers and a blessing on the house mr faddy went off to his place beside clara st aubin on the back seat of the landau which was to convey the departing guest to the bodmin road station a two hours drive through the brisk autumn air and thus like the shadowy figures in a dissolving view christabel's guests melted away and she and jessie bridgeman stood alone in the grand old hall which had been of late so perverted from its old sober air and quiet domestic uses her first act as the carriage drove away was to fling one of the casements wide open open the other windows jessie she said impetuously all of them do you know that the wind is in the east i know that it is pure and sweet the breath of heaven blowing over hill and sea and that it is sweeping away the tainted atmosphere of the last month the poison of scandal and slang and cigarettes and billiard marker talk and all that is most unlovely in life oh jessie thank god you and i are alone together and the play is played out did you see your husband to-day before he left no why should we meet any more what can we two have to say to each other then he left his home without a word from you said jessie with a shade of wonder his home repeated christabel the home in which his poor mother thought it would be my lot to make his life good and happy if she could know but no thank god the dead are at peace no jessie he did not go without one word from me i wrote a few lines of farewell i told him i had prayed to my god for power to pity and forgive him and that pity and pardon had come to me i implored him to make his future life one long atonement for that fatal act last year i who had sinned so deeply had no right to take a high tone i spoke to him as a sinner to a sinner i hope he does repent that he will atone said miss bridgeman gloomily his life is in his own keeping thank god that you and i are rid of him and can live the rest of our days in peace very quietly flows the stream of life at mount royal now that these feverish scenes have passed into the shadow of the days that are no more christabel devotes herself to the rearing of her boy lives for him thinks for him finds joy in his boyish pleasures grieves for his boyish griefs teaches him walks with him rides with him watches and nurses him in every childish illness and wonders that her life is so full of peace and sunshine the memory of a sorrowful past can never cease to be a part of her life all those scenes she loves best in this world the familiar places amidst which her quiet days are spent are haunted by one mournful shadow but she loves the hills and the seashore only the dearer for that spiritual presence which follows her in the noontide and the gloaming for ever reminding her amidst the simple joys of the life she knows of that unknown life where the veil shall be lifted and the lost shall be found major brie is her devoted friend and adviser idolizes the boy and just manages to prevent his manliness deteriorating under the pressure of womanly indulgence and womanly fears jessie has refused that faithful admirer a second time but christabel has an idea that he means to tempt his fate again and in the end must prevail by sheer force of goodness and fidelity kneeling by angus hamley's grave little leo hears from his mother's lips how the dead man loved him and bequeathed his fortune to him the mother endeavours to explain in simplest clearest words how the wealth so entrusted to him should be a sacred charge never to be turned to evil uses or squandered in self-indulgence you will try to do good when you are a man won't you leo she asks smiling down at the bright young face which shines like a sunbeam in its childish gladness yes he answers confidently i'll give uncle jake's tobacco this is his widest idea of benevolence at the present stage of his development end of chapter thirteen end of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden recorded by celine major